So Galatians 4, 21 into 5, 1. Please listen as I read the word of God. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That text was the reason I didn't want to preach through Galatians. It's very harsh to our ears, and hopefully we'll see what the Lord has uh, for us through it. <clears throat> How many religions are there in the world, do you think? How many traditions or, or paths do people try to approach God by? I looked it up this morning, actually. It's like, it would be good to know what, what is said. Some, somewhere over 4,000 formal religions. Religious traditions that seek to approach God in some way. And I've, I've heard it likened to, you know, there's, there's a mountain, and to get to the mountain pop, uh, top, there's all kinds of paths up the mountain. It's a very postmodern today or even Eastern philosophy would, would say that they all lead to the top of the mountain. Just some are harder than others. In some cases, you may have to rock climb. In other cases, you're bushwhacking, and then there's, there's an easier way that's a, a nice, smooth path, and that would be the best way, but, but they'll all get there, and you have to choose the path for you. Of course, every religion thinks it's exclusive, and so most religions would disagree with that. But what about the 4,000-plus religions? What are we to make of that? Is there really 4,000-plus different ways to get to God? And we Christians think we just have the right way. Well, the Bible says there might be lots of different traditions, lots of different religious practices, but, but actually there's only two ways that people try to approach God. A works way and a faith way. A way based on my effort and my way to try to get to God and a faith way that, that views the gospel as God came to us an easy way, and a hard way. Now, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus even talks about two ways. He says this in Matthew 7, 13, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. That might not be what we think. Like, why is Jesus saying that, that the easy way leads to destruction and the hard way leads to him when just a few verses before he says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. How do we reconcile 
the way to God as being the hard way when Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. My yoke is hard? No, he says easy. What are we to make of that? Yet the hard way is logically easier because the way of faith logically should be easier. You let go of your works and your efforts and you rely on somebody else's work and effort. Yet it's the hardest thing for every human to do is to give up that control. The easy way is harder because it brings with it much heartache, disappointment, and it's a way that is all focused on the self, the me, and we live in the highs and the lows. I'm doing good. Maybe we get a little prideful. God must love me more. I'm not doing so good. We feel inadequate. Works righteousness. It's a great paradox in the Christian life that the hard way is logically easier and the easy way is harder. Even the phrase walk by faith. Think of the words. What is walking? Action, activity, something you're doing. You're walking and yet by faith. What is faith? Faith faith expresses passivity because how do we get grace? But we receive grace by faith. There's, There's an active passivity. Francis Schaeffer in his his book, True Spirituality, talks about this active passivity that is the way of the Christian life. He he thinks of Mary. The angel comes to Mary and tells her she's going to be the mother of the Son of God. What does Mary say back? Be it unto me according to your will. Active passivity, receiving the promise of God and walking in faith in it. Does not Jesus model that when he tells the father not my will but yours be done and then he walks by the spirit to the cross how do we know when we're living by works or by faith when we're walking by works or by faith when our motives are self-serving or they're out of love when we're trying to bring about God's plans by, by our own effort and means or when we're simply responding to the grace he gives us to walk by faith Paul, for four chapters, has been saying there's only two ways to live, the gospel and the false gospel. Only two religions. And yet, since we are all originally sons and daughters of Adam, who Adam, of course, failed the test, we all, at some point, some level, want to be under the law. That is trying to show God that we are acceptable to him through effort. That's where Adam failed. First verse of our text, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? That's the point in Romans 2. Or Romans also. Even Christians do this. Instead of resting in the freedom of who God says we are in Christ, we resort to the law and try to show him we're valuable to him when we're already infinitely valuable to him. If or whether you struggle with, struggle with insecurity or pride, you are focused on you. Let me say that again. We think only pride is self-righteousness. But even insecurity is a form of self-righteousness because you feel in your insecurity or your inadequacy that that makes you less valuable to God. Two sides of the same coin. It's a works-based system. You are not accepted because of you. How you feel in the matter does not communicate who you are. We need to cling to our identity in Christ. And our text today summarizes all this in an allegory, a a metaphor, that there are two ways to live, two paths to follow, two patterns to model, two approaches to our relationship with God, two roads to walk on, yet only one leads to life, acceptance, freedom, and God. Let's look at this complicated story, this complicated history. And as I've already said, I've dreaded preaching this, the book of Galatians because of this text. And I've spoken to other pastors who have said the same thing because, I mean, I understand what's going on in the text, but like, what a story, especially in our context today, where we're reeling from the effects of the slave trade in our own nation and how to understand that, why why God would use slavery as a primary example 
of the gospel and such harshness in it. I mean, the, the story is Sarah gives her servant, her maidservant, a slave to her husband to have a baby with. Does she have a choice in the matter? And then when she has the baby, she gets jealous and she sends him away. <laughs> and God even says, cast them out. It's hard. It's harsh to our ears. What do we do with that? But yet, maybe if we can look past the harshness, can we see the grand story of, in redemption in this? And maybe God needed such a harsh example to truly communicate the seriousness of the human predicament in these two ways. So you remember the context of Galatians. These Galatian Christians who Paul saw come to faith and received the freedom that that meant. They didn't have a Jewish background, and these Jews come from outside, it says, to spy out their freedom earlier. And they don't like that they're living so free because the Jewish people come from the line of Abraham, who's referenced here. And Abraham, of course, was given you to be circumcised. This identifies you with the covenant community. And then through Abraham centuries later you get Moses in the law and the Jews were supposed to follow the law and you Christians are living too free you need these things so Paul had already said in chapter 3 haven't you read what the scriptures said Abraham believed God and it was credited to him or accounted to him as being righteous before he was circumcised that Abraham was made acceptable to God by God. He received it through faith before any obedience. Now he uses another example from Abraham's life to show also what imperfect faith Abraham had, and yet the promises of God still hold, even though he failed in his works and he had imperfect faith. Abraham was in his 70s when God came to him and Sarah. They were Abram and Sarai at that point. Abr uh, Sarah was in her 60s. And God says, I will make you the father of many nations. Sarah was barren, couldn't have children. She's in her 60s, Abraham in his 70s. What are they to make of it? And yet he says, leave your home and all your family and go away. And over a decade, God makes them wealthy and rich and they have servants and everything except an heir no child we read in a call to worship how Abraham even kind of told God look you've made me wealthy that's great what good is it I have nobody to pass it on to I'll give it to one of my servants the person who's in charge of the household God says no I'm going to give you a son I told you that Abraham says I'm in my 80s and she's in her 90s, 70s come on so Sarah remembers, hey, you know, I've heard something. God helps those who help themselves. Look, bear a child, and I'm in my 70s? We got this young servant here. She's in her 20s or 30s. Go for it. It's a reenactment of the garden where the woman tells the, son, the, the husband, eat of this tree. And so Abraham does. You don't see him argue it. Uh, Hagar has Ishmael. And now, Sarah wasn't ready for this, the servant slave woman is gaining favor in Abraham's eyes. And Sarah's self-worth as a barren woman is very low. And she sees this servant woman getting more attention. And so the servant woman, Hagar, starts persecuting Sarah. Look, he loves me more than you. I gave him a son. You ever wonder when you're supposed to act and when you're supposed to wait on the Lord? Of course you have. That's the whole Christian dilemma. You sense something, it's like, what do, what do you want me to do, Lord? You place this on my heart, it's not happening group of philosophers in the 1980s called The Clash sang the song, Should I Stay or Should I Go Now? If I stay, there will be trouble. If I go, there will be double. We have decisions to make. How do we make them? What do we do? At times, we're called to set goals and work feverishly toward them, and other times, we're told to wait. Are we always told to wait? 
Back in, in the book of Exodus in chapter 14, when Moses, God through Moses delivers the children of Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness and they're going to cross the Red Sea, they're now backed up against the Red Sea and the Egyptian army is bearing down on them and the people start grumbling to Moses. And Moses, like a good fearless leader, stands. He says, God has not brought you this far to let you die here. He will be our savior. He will be our rock. He will save us. Then the next verse, God says this. Why do you cry to me, Moses? Tell the people to go forward. What are we to understand in that? That to the people, Moses was showing a good face, but to God, he's saying, what are you going to do here? And God says, why are you looking at me? You know what I told you. Go do it. So Abraham acted when he should have waited, and Moses was hesitating when he should have acted. And that shows you that it's not this just let go and let God and just see what happens in your life. There's an active passivity that we are called to walk in faith in what God calls us to do. And that's the hardest thing in the world. How do you know if the person you're going to marry is the right person to marry? How do you know what job to take? How do you know if you should buy a house now or later? How do you know if you should change jobs? How do you make these decisions? How do you evaluate your motives? Is it me, Lord, or is it you? Do you want me to do this or not? I've been asked many times how I became to be a pastor. Every pastor is usually asked that. I think my grandparents, they were predicting it from when I was a little kid. <laughs> But well, you know my story. I went off into the corporate world and just lived a crazy wild life. And when I came out of the corporate world, I actually had a uh, contracted career development firm helping me with what I want to do with my life. And they gave me all these assessments and they came up with two things that they said you're well suited for. Engineering wasn't one of them, by the way. <laughs> one was to be a teacher, one was to be a, a pastor. And I laughed at that because I wasn't even in a church. So I went, bought, went to become a teacher. But then when the Lord started putting the, the, the desire to be an under-shepherd of his, to be a minister of the gospel, I, I said, you know, Lord, I, I am a goal-driven person. Set goals and I get them. This is one area I'm not doing that. Because I know you raise up leadership in the church and you bring down leadership in the church. And if, if this is going to happen, you're going to have to do it. It took them... I don't know, I didn't look at the, but a dozen years? <laughs> and he did it. I told him, I'm not knocking down any doors for this, but yet he kept opening doors, and it took a decade. And have you ever waited on the Lord for a job or for marriage or how to fix a problem or when to move or any of those things? So Abraham and Sarah waited over a decade, took matters into their own hands, because, I mean, that's a long time. And yet, 14 years after that, now Abraham's 100 and Sarah's 90, she gets pregnant. <laughs> that has to be God, right? I mean, she's barren her whole life. She couldn't, she couldn't conceive a child. Now, not only has she you know, never been able to conceive a child, she's actually past the... I want to ask who's 100 here. Do you want... <laughs> or 90 here. I mean, do you want to have a baby? Wow. Isaac is born of promise. God had promised. Ishmael is born of the flesh. Literally the flesh, but signifying human effort. I don't know, God. I don't, I'm just taking too long. I'm going to take matters in my own hands. Maybe that's what you want. God promised. Just like Hagar mocked Sarah, Ishmael mocks Isaac. <laughs> you got a war in the house. Paul says this story, this terrible history, this big mistake, this is not an, an endorsement of polygamy or slavery. We're dealing with the effects of these bad decisions today. You, I mean, you, you all know in Islam, they trace their roots to Ishmael. And the Arab world is born out of Ishmael and Esau and, you know. And we see conflict thousands of years later. This is not an endorsement of that. But Paul says this can be interpreted allegorically, metaphorically, you know, I talk of, t of types here, that things in the Old Testament represent greater realities, usually often seen in Christ. Paul says this, these two things can be viewed as two covenants. God's got a covenant. 
What two things? The two mothers, the two sons, even the two Jerusalems and the two mountains. The two covenants are the two ways of how we approach God and and view how we are acceptable to him. Our whole approach to life, our whole worldview is based on this. Hagar is the servant and the slave, which means the son she has is a slave. Ishmael is born through the flesh, like I said, literally by human effort. It represents trying to use the law as a means to bring about God's satisfaction. And that is why it's called Mount Sinai. Because that's where God gives the law to Moses. And it's interesting, Paul says that Mount Sinai is outside of Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting that the Jewish people get the law not in the promised land? But then Paul says a revolutionary thing. That that covenant of slavery represents present Jerusalem. The current Jewish people at that time. That would be mind-blowing. Jerusalem is supposed to be the city of God. Yet he's saying it turned pagan. Because there's another Jerusalem, a Jerusalem in heaven. There's another mountain, not Mount Sinai. Mount Zion, Hebrews 12, makes that connection. Two things. Jerusalem in that time where the Jewish people were coming from was associated with the world as a false approach to how to get to God. And earlier in this same chapter, Paul called that the elementary principles of the world. The first time he uses that phrase in chapter 4, he's referring to the Jewish people, their religion. The next time he uses that phrase, he's referring to the The next time he uses pagans. What does that mean? It means it's the same thing. Not the Jews. They had turned it and used it as a means to be acceptable to God. The point is there are two approaches to life and two paths. One is much easier than the other, and the easier one is actually the harder one, as I've already said. In other words, it should be easier to rest on Christ's work and to cling to your new identity in Christ than it is to try to make your own work and build your own identity. Shouldn't it be easier? Here's a gift or work for it. And what do we try to do? Our default mode is try to work for it because we're not wired the way that way to accept the gift because the old Adam is still in us that old covenant of works he tries to rear his head even though we're represented by the new Adam see we are hard coded to try to earn what we get so success breeds self-righteousness now you know what self-righteousness breeds contempt for others just like Hagar had with Sarah and Ishmael with Isaac so you feel better and you think others are worse But on the flip side, when you're discouraged because you're struggling and not successful in your lives and your jobs and your relationships or your marriage or in school kids, if you feel inadequate or insecure, that's also, as I've said at the beginning, a works righteous system. Because your inadequacy does not change your value to God. But you think it's up to you. Because you make it all based about you and your perceived work. See, the Bible calls that living in the flesh. We think living in the flesh, when you hear that, oh, the flesh, it's sexual sins and crimes. and Yeah, that's one form of it the Bible uses, but, but so often it uses the system of you trying to earn your place with God out of your own effort as operating in the flesh. The elementary principles of the world. calls it living by the flesh or our old identity in Adam or our old man and slavery it's slavery to running on a treadmill or never actually getting any and never actually getting ever slavery to our emotions how you feel does not determine how God feels about you how you feel does not determine how God feels about you they're not the judge of your worth We're slaves to being our own gods and trying to fulfill our own passions. But folks, we're called to freedom. And that's why we need a new covenant, not one of works, but of grace. When Adam falls under the covenant of works, God institutes the covenant of grace right in the garden. Promises. 
God sets out to do for us what we can't do for ourselves, which is make us his and restore the relationship and make us free from all those things we already said. So to Adam and Eve in the garden, God promises that he would send one who would make it right. To Noah, God promises that his covenant with Adam and Eve still holds, that he is going to still make it right. To Abraham, he promises from his lineage one would come through whom the whole world would be blessed. To David, he promises that his son would be a king with an everlasting kingdom who would break the cycle of sin and death and the roller coaster and the treadmill would be done. To Jeremiah and Ezekiel, he promises a new covenant. One not like the one on Mount Sinai where the law was written on blocks of stone which represents your stony hearts but one where he gives us hearts of flesh and he inscribes his law on it. Actually, he places his very will inside our DNA and our living, beating hearts that he gives us. So you no longer view the law like it's a rule to follow. You know, I was talking this week to some people about this. So many people, when they're about to make a terrible sin or they're going to go headlong into doing something that the Scripture forbids, happening all the time. You know what they ask me? Well, where does it say that? You know you're a legalist if you're looking for a prohibition against what you want to do because rather than say, where does it forbid that, which I can go to and I go to, Christians ought to say, what is pleasing to God? Do you see the difference? How do you view the law of God? Do you view it as something you are not to do or something you are commanded to do? Or do you, when you think of your relationship with your Father in heaven who has made you a new creation in Christ, do you say, what would be pleasing to you in this, ter- in this time, Lord? Not, what are you telling me not to do? You know, it's like if you have adult kids and, and, and your adult child, and not that parents can be infallible, but you could see your child about to do something wrong, and, and, or even if you have a teenage kid, whatever, and you say, like, like, you shouldn't do that. I don't want you to do that. And they ask you, well, are you telling me I can't do it? And maybe you say, no, I'm not telling you you can't. I want you to choose the right thing. And they say, well, you didn't tell me I couldn't, so I did it. How does it make you feel? The law is not meant for that. And if you use it for that, then it it is meant to crush you. But these things should be hard-coded into our very DNA. We see all those things I said, Adam, Noah, Abraham, David, the prophets, whoever. God is a God of promise. And what's the point? That God's promises are infinitely greater than your works. We rest on his promises. And we see that in Jesus, all those things come to pass. He passes the test where all these people fail. And then he pays the the penalty for all their and our failures. He fulfills the covenant of works so that we can be recipients of the covenant of grace. Two ways. Why would we turn back to the old way? That is why promise is contrasted with works. Like I said, his promises are better than your works. That's why slavery is contrasted with freedom because in Christ we are released from the bondage to these hopeless world systems and our bondage to our sin. That is why being a child is contrasted with being an orphan earlier in Galatians because in Christ we are accepted and loved despite our flaws and failures. We don't have, we're not called to have the insecurity that I'm only as valuable as my last success and there will always be somebody better than me to make me get knocked down, to hold me in contempt. When you're a child, you don't worry about that. You don't worry about what somebody outside the family thinks. This is why being an actual child of God is the key. To all who believed in Jesus Christ, he gave the right to be called children of God. It's why he tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. Born of what? Born of spirit, not flesh. Born of promise, not works. How did you get born presently? Did you do anything for that? You just showed up here one day. (laughs) same way you don't choose to be born physically that's not a choice that's something that happens to you that you receive by faith then you walk in active passivity in the new calling you have as a child of God have you received his call 
All this is why we need Jesus. And it's why for our declaration of faith, we've been saying over and over Galatians 4, 4 to 7. I'm hoping we'll memorize it by then. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son, and if son, then an heir through God. Your new identity changes which way you're trying to get to God, and yet the old man in us needs to always be reminded of that. This is why we need to commit to freedom from the law. We don't want to be under the law. Spurgeon says you don't want to be under it. It's lording it over you. It's a road we walk on. It's under us. We need to commit to living by faith. That has been the point of this book all along. Not just justification by faith, but sanctification by faith and adoption by faith and all of it. In Galatians 3, a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And again, let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing by faith? So you are justified, declared right by God, by faith. But then what, what about our sanctification? I have been crucified with Christ, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the actual flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So life by faith. Born by faith, life by faith. He says it again. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? The answer is no. It's rhetorical. You were born by the Spirit, now you live by the Spirit. Faith. And then our adoption. Galatians uh, 3.26. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. Sanctification, justification, adoption. We live by faith, not trying to be accepted by what we do, but since we are accepted, we want to do what God wants us to do. We reverse those all the time. We think, I do... And God accepts us. It's you are accepted, and then you do things that are pleasing Him. Don't get this wrong that this is some antinomian message that Christians can live however they want. The whole the next two chapters, He's gonna He's gonna tell you what the fruit of the Spirit are. He's gonna tell you how to diagnose as somebody a Christian by by what their life exhibits as a result of the gospel. So I don't want to make that error. But two more takeaways. The first one was commit to freedom from the law. The second one is verse uh, 29 talks about persecution from people who are spying out your freedom, the legalists. We should expect that we're going to re receive resistance when we're living in the freedom that Christ has given us by people who are legalists, who have created systems that you must do to be acceptable. And, and typically it's, well, I do it this way, so you ought to do it this way. We spent all of June talking about all these false gospels of ways Christians prioritize a list of things and then impose that upon the Christian life and make it normative for everybody else. Expect it. That's why he says Hagar persecuted uh, Sarah and Ishmael Isaac. But the second thing he says, because he said in verse 29, just as that, at that time as they were persecuted, uh, what does the scripture say? Verse 30, cast out the slave woman and her son for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Again, harsh words. That's how strong Paul views this. He's telling these Galatian Christians that if these Jews don't knock it off, cast them out. Yikes. Of course, we call people to repentance. We preach the true gospel and we want to see the fruit of that and we are all recovering legalists. And so, really, rather than viewing this as somebody imposing legalism on me and we got to throw them out of the church, let's view this in our own life. Where are you returning to some legalistic system? See, it's easy to call others out as legalists. How are you persecuting yourself? Pressuring yourself that you don't live up to God? I'm not telling you don't repent. The Christian life is repentant faith. 
we recognize these things, but then we turn to Romans 1. <laughs> There's no condemnation, no Romans 8, no condemnation. Are you living on the roller coaster of inadequacy or self righteousness? Do you let your emotions determine your value, thinking that God loves you more or less depending on your performance? That's unbelief. It's not faith, that's flesh. God says you are his child. Cast those things out. Root that legalism out of your hearts. Ask the Spirit to show you where you are trusting in other things for your relationship with God instead of what Christ has done for you. Banish it from your life. Call, cast out all manner of legalism out of the church, but out of your life. Root it out. It's exhausting and it's damning. So we go back to that beginning question. How many ways are there people trying to reach God? We said it, there's two. I try to claw my way to God or God comes down to me and I receive it. All the 4,000 plus religions or the millions and millions of, of ways people think they're going to God are either humans trying to get to the afterlife on their own or clawing their way. Only Christianity is a relationship. And the warning here that Paul says about Judaism, calling Judaism a pagan system now, Paul has already said Christianity can become that too. That's why he calls it a false gospel. That's why we need to root these things out. Back to that mountain example. So it's not that there are 4,000 paths up a mountain and only one reaches the top in Christianity. It's not even that there are two paths up the mountain and one leads to a dead end and the other one gets there. Paul says these are two different mountains. That everybody trying to reach God on their own, so he calls it Mount Sinai, is a different mountain. Because in Revelation, Mount Zion comes to you. And brings you to it. Brings you to God. And Mount Zion represents grace. Which mountain do you belong to? Which Jerusalem? Which covenant are you resting on? Which person? Christ yourself. If you are a Christian, believe God when he says you are his child, infinitely beloved and valuable and precious so much that he sent his son for you. Stop judging your worth or your accomplishments and failures and stop trying to prove yourself to God. Get off the treadmill of works righteousness and live in the sunshine of his smile as his law is already encoded on your hearts. Now do what pleases your father. It's a different system. If you're not a Christian, if you want freedom to be fully known and truly loved despite your flaws and failures, you too can get off the treadmill, lay down your attempts at being your own God and your own Savior and submit to the God who comes to you with active passivity. Receive his grace by expressing repentant faith in the one who did the work, who fulfilled the covenant so that you can have a new covenant. You can do that by the grace of God. Let's pray.